Yeah, he one of them ghetto boys in the bushwick. That's the mentality that keep niggas sick. Come on, dog. You think you're a pit? You meant to grow here, and that's what you pick? Don't worry about me, nigga. See, that is your problem. You always run to your mouth. Remember what mom had that electric problem? Did you help her out? Dewan died, nigga. Doobie died, nigga. Cussy died, nigga. Debo died, and you could have been with him if you didn't make it out that job by. Remember when you. What it do? It's your boy Chillin' Gentleman, and we back with another. Man, y'all already know what time it is, man. We got the life and death of El Hacon de la Sierra. Now, I might have said Hacon wrong, but I believe it's El Hacon de la Sierra. You know what I'm saying? It was, I seen in the comments, he was like, hey, Chima, can you react to the life and death of El Arcon de la Sierra? I said, for sure, man, you know what I'm saying? That's what we do over here. And if you subscribe, that's even better. That's why I need to start checking. If you subscribe, you want to tell me, oh, yeah, dude, you subscribe, brother, you know what I'm saying? So you get to see more and more and more. Anyway, you know, I'm bringing up subscribe because you see this over here, man? How dare you? After all we've been through, what's our one? What's our two? <laughs> Come on, man. We got to change that. You know what I'm saying? Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Anyway, make sure y'all uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram. Yeah, well, follow me on Instagram, man. I already know what time it is, man. It's time to get to it. You dig? Mm -hmm. <gasps> He changed the music up? He used to be like, eh, eh, eh. Please respect the cartels. Uh, hold on, I gotta go back because I gotta listen to what he's talking about now. You know what I'm saying? If y'all know his old intro, y'all know it will be like, eh, eh, eh. Okay. Some musicians choose to respect the cartels but maintain their distance, understanding the influence they wield. Right. Others look to capitalize on that power and use it to their advantage. Oh no. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. For far too many narco corrido artists, the thing that makes them famous can often be the same thing to get them killed. Exactly. Hey, to anybody that's inspired by the cartels, and you know you ain't about that life or nothing, hey man, just stay far away, brother. You know what I'm saying? You think it's a joke. Like, I ain't joined no gang because I know it wasn't for me. You know what I'm saying? It's no joke out here. So, yeah, I'll leave that to y'all. You know what I'm saying? I'll stay in my lane. You dig? Never be scared to stay in your own lane, man. Fabian Ortega Pinon's story is one of the tragic instances where the lines between musicians and the cartels they write about begin to blur. Right, see. Known as El Hacón de la Sierra, Ortega seemed to have... El Hacón de la Sierra. See, I had it right. <laughs> it's me, baby. <laughs> Come on. His own set of hawks following him. You had a beat to this? Yeah, wait a minute. Uh, go on, oh, yeah. Boy had a bird on his hand, or they put that fake arm or something. San Jose. Come on now, y'all want to do this right now? Come on now. In a small town about 250 kilometers northwest of Chihuahua, resided the Ortegas, a modest farming family. There's a place called Chihuahua? On April 18, 1982, Fabian Ortega Pinon was born during a period of emergence for the worldwide drug trade. Alright, alright. A 
allegiances shifted following the dissolution of the Guadalajara cartel and battle for territory forced the Chihuahua region directly into the crossfire. Mm. Young Fabian sought refuge in music and performance from an early age was invited to perform at several local fairs and festivals. Although biographical references are not clear in the matter, it appears that Ortega decided to drop out of high school at the age of 15, pursue music full time, moving to mm. Los Mochis, Sinaloa. Now listen, I'm all about you achieving your goal, you know what I'm saying? Doing what you love doing, I don't care. But at least make it out of high school first, you know what I'm saying? And some of y'all might say, bro, he did what he loved to do, and that exactly. Yeah, I might say, so what's the difference? If he was 15, he dropped out, or even if he graduated high school, what's the difference? He just had experience graduating high school. That's the difference, you know what I'm saying? But either way it go, he went to go live his dreams, you know what I'm saying? That's the most important. But I'm just saying, I ain't saying, oh, my God, you got to go to college, then you got to go to at least make it out of high school. That's all I'm saying. You dig? Ortega was unable to find his lucky break in the city, and during that same year of 1997, relocated to the much smaller town nearby, Guasave. Guasave, Sinaloa. It was here that a young Ortega would come into contact with the recently established Titan Records and its founder, Senor Rigoberto Garcia Perez. Garcia had just launched a career. You know what's crazy though? You know, some of these dudes. Might be y'all relatives. Some of y'all might know they y'all relatives. Some of y'all, uh, you know, I'm talking about as far as like cartels going and everything. Like, you might think y'all not even related to, you know what I'm saying? Some people, some of y'all might be related to El Chapo, y'all don't even know it. Which is crazy, you know what I'm saying? But let's keep going. Of El Las de la Sierra, and the very first Titan Records release I could find dates back to January 1st, 1997. Garcia seemed to see the value in marketing the Sierra region, was in fact the creator of Fabian's stage name. By the end of 1997, and under Garcia's direction, Fabian had begun to perform under the name El Jacón de la Sierra. Hold on. It's very important, that's why I had to rewind it, you know what I'm saying? Very important. And the very important. first Titan Records release I can find dates back to January 1st, 1997. Garcia seemed to see the value in marketing the Sierra region, was in fact the creator of Fabian's stage name. By the end of 1997, and under Garcia's direction, Fabian had begun to perform under the name El Jacón de la Sierra. According to a bio written by Garcia himself, the first album released by Fabian was Mi Texana 100X, recorded during late 1997 to early 1998. Mm. Despite yeah, this, the earliest that. dated release, according to Amazon, appears to be El Miro Shaka, released on April 21st, 1998, just three days after his 16th birthday. Mm. With his career already in motion at the age of 15, it's no surprise that concepts like copyright and trademark were an afterthought. It's likely that the driving force behind Ortega's early catalog was Garcia. Uh, dang, just imagine, you know what I'm saying, you being 16. And that's where most people get influenced with gangs, cartels. They get it's mostly when they're young. You know what I'm saying? It's like they mostly get into it when they're young. Cause once you older, you you're like yeah, I'm, I'm cool. But it's like they wait. It's that stage. It's right around that stage. If they could pull up a poll or something, like fact sheet or whatever, I'm telling you, around the time where people get into gangs or cartels, whatever. It's around them ages, you know what I'm saying? Them young ages, well, turns, teenagers. Still owns the rights to all of his work. Oh, that's dope. He he on the or he on the rights to his music. Let's go. We gotta capitalize that. If y'all don't know how powerful that is, then y'all gotta man, y'all. Yeah. The decision to have El Hacon de la Sierra posing with an assault rifle in a pickup truck was most definitely a conscious effort and one that established his image as a narco-corrido artist early on. Although originally a young farmer from Chihuahua, 
the 17-year-old was now rubbing elbows with members of Sinaloa's rich and dangerous cartel. That's what I'm saying, bro. It's all a setup, man. If you ain't about it, don't let them, you know what I'm saying? Whoever tried to set you up, hey, man, it'd be good if you take a picture with this gun. Come on. No, man. No. Simple. For the next few years, Ortega's music was picked up by regional radio stations across the western coast of Mexico, leading to his first series of live performances in clubs and dance halls. Así Culiacán. It wasn't until early 2000 that the 18-year-old Ortega would reach the United States when he began to receive airplay from KBUE and was subsequently invited to perform at the KBUE K Buena Music Festival in Los Angeles, California. Mm. It just so happens that the pro- Trust everybody from California. Let's go. South Central LA, LA what it is. Program director of KBUE was regional Mexican figure Pepe Garza, who at the time was growing infamous for finding and making stars within the genre. By the end of 2001, Ortega had already nine albums recorded and released through Titan Records. Mm -hmm. Although his early music often told stories of drug dealing and other criminal escapades, there was no clear signs of any affiliation. On May 19, 2002, Ortega released the Corrido in honor of the former leader of the Sinaloan cartel, Chapo Guzman. No Chapo. Coincidentally, Guzman was one year removed from his infamous 2001 prison escape and was reportedly hiding out nearby in the city of Culiacan, Sinaloa. Sinaloa, Culiacan. He would follow this up with another track on Ure Trono e Corona, titled El Corrido de Jorge Mendoza. Mendoza is an elusive figure known as La Gata, or the Claw. Mm. Details about Mendoza are far and few between, but it has been confirmed that he was a figure of notable power and he eventually formed Jalisco New Generation Cartel, an armed wing that has supported the Sinaloa Cartel in various instances. Ortega's honorary corridos seem to increase his fame tenfold, and his record label Titan took advantage of the surge by signing a deal with Sony Discos naming Ortega specifically as a key reason for the deal. Mm. The next mention of a major figure came during July 2004 when Ortega penned a song to Javier Torres, known widely as Javier Torres Felix. Mm. Torres is currently serving an expected life sentence in Mexican prison and is a former high-ranking leader in the Sinaloa cartel and right hand of Almeo Zambada. Mm. Ortega's song was released July 2004, just seven months after Torres was apprehended by authorities outside Culiacan, Sinaloa. When GAF forces circled in on Torres, he used his own squad of 30 men as an attempted diversion, resulting in an all-out firefight. Great. It is believed that throughout the duration of 2004 to 2009, Ortega frequently performed at the parties of high-level cartel members. While he collected payments and lived the high life, it seemed that the allegiances and alliances were steadily shifting behind the scenes. In fact, two days before his eventual arrest, he was even recorded at an alleged narco party while armed guards with assault rifles peppered the background. Mm. Ortega's next noteworthy event came during June 2009 when he was partying on a yacht off the coast of Baja, California, Mexico. His company included a wealthy entrepreneur from Rodorito nicknamed El Cande. Although he had his hand in some legitimate business, the near majority of his wealth came from one thing only, Crystal. El Cande was one of the most sought after cooks employed by the Sinaloa and Tijuana cartels. While on board the yacht, authorities seized a kilo of crystal meth, 
two shotguns, two pistols, and mm. a revolver, in addition to 800 cartridges of ammo, two vehicles, and 20k. Golly! As forces circled the yacht, everyone aboard the ship had already thrown their cell phone into the ocean. Local newspapers referred to the event as a narco party, and Ortega was caught right in the middle. Everyone on board was detained by federal authorities and taken into question, reported 21 individuals in total. Charges reportedly only handed out to three out of the 21. Wow. It's clear to see who was the odd man out in that scenario. The news of Ortega's arrest spread throughout Mexico and even forced the 27-year-old to comment on the matter. He acknowledged his troubled past and that he had put it behind him. Although he attempted to publicly put this incident behind him, some tensions cannot be eased. It is not known exactly what led to the tragic demise of Ortega, but like any death- Cause y'all kept telling me how Chalino Sanchez died, but- Y'all tell me in different versions. Oh, he died like this. Oh, he died like that. And I'm like, yeah, I got confused after a while. It's like, oh, he died like this. He died. You know what I'm saying? After making a career in the states of Sinaloa and Tijuana, Ortega returned to his home state of Chihuahua to see his friends and family. In the near 13 years since he lived there, alliances had shifted drastically. Mm. Going back to your home town. Traveling along a highway between La Junta and La Tomosi de Guerrero, Ortega's vehicle was tailed by an unknown assailant. Authorities reported that based on the arrangement of the bodies, Ortega likely pulled over to investigate the trailing party. Along with his cousin Jesus and friend Manuel, the three stepped out of the vehicle. When authorities came across the scene, they claimed to have collected 80 automatic shell casings in total and that all three individuals were arranged in need. But then it's like, you can't even trust the cops either. So it's like, you don't know if they was a part of it either. And they probably lying to cover it up. Broke with so. signs of execution. At the age of 28 years old, Fabian Ortega Pinon was assassinated and added to the ever-growing list of narco corrido artists who have been murdered for the songs they sang and the friendships they formed. Crazy. Just the day before his death, he had released his 44th official release, according to Spotify. This was ironically named Adios a Mi Amigos. Oh, yes. That's crazy. As is the case with the majority of narco corrido artists, backhanded contracts determined that the royalties and rights of the Ortega's recordings are not owed to his family but instead the owner of his record label, Rigoberta Garcia. He didn't own the rights to his name. It's no surprise that Garcia has continued to release albums under his name, given he owns the rights. As it stands, there are 55 albums available by Ortega on Spotify. I'll let you form your own opinions as to whether that constitutes exploitation or not. Bro, that's crazy, bro. This is crazy. It went from him owning his music to we figuring out he don't own his music. You know what I'm saying? Hey, y'all let me know what y'all think about this in the comments and stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? Y'all let me know. If the video get a little sketchy, it's because I had uh, my memory on my phone was tripping. You know what I'm saying? So, my, you know, how that go? Anyway, make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and all that, man. You know what I'm saying? Came turned up with the energy. Make sure you subscribe. Don't forget. Like, why you just didn't pause the video and subscribe? You couldn't do that. It's a two second, too many, too many. You know? But anyway, this is what you're doing. Guess what? I'm out. Figured out she was playing board games on my chest. I feel sorry, sight. I don't care if she was in trouble, pipe. Saying yes, she loved a tan. Lying, said she loved a man. Her name should be Spider because she loved a win.
Had me guessing from the top of my dome like headbands. Everything was really good. I thought we really had a plan. I didn't understand, but it's alright. Some things you gotta learn. I think she was a bird, but I had to learn myself. The only way I'ma find out is when I have money and wealth. She said she leaving because she thought I had love for somebody else. She, she left, left me in the cold. She, she left, left me in the cold. cold.